Good morning and welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. You're, you're very welcome. Uh, forestry is a, is a key part of our climate change uh, targets, but also a, a key contributor to producing the timber that our, our industries need uh, going forward. But achieving levels of, of uh, planting has been very challenging in recent years. And in the last uh, last year, we saw the introduction of a new scheme to attempt to, to reverse this low uh, planting rate. Uh, this has brought increased premium, but there's also a, a high level of restriction, I think, on some of the lands that are allowed uh, now to uh, to be planted, and I suppose a, a more restrictive in a, uh, it's more restrictive in what you can plant. This morning, I'm, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by. Uh, Seppi Hona, uh, Inspector with the Department of Agriculture on Forestry, and Tom Houlihan, uh, our Acting Head of, of Forestry Department. Uh, folks, you're very welcome. Yes, good morning. Thanks, Pat. Uh, and good morning. You had it yourself and Liam, I think, a little bit of a surprise when you woke up this morning. Yeah, absolutely. We had a few inches of snow up here in the northwest rain base, so now we're all up and running here now. So I'll share my screen there. Can everyone see that? Very good, yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. As I said, thanks, Pat, for the introductions. I'm going to go through uh, the main incentives and measures that we have in place for the new forestry programme. I look at the, the different forest types and look at the different grant rates available to landowners and farmers for uh, under the new forestry programme between now and 2027. So you might you might have seen some of these farm book these booklets that we've issued around the in the in, in the media and on social media and. In paper format, you might have received some of these from your Chagas Forestry Advisors or your forestry consultants. They're just uh, little booklets that we've uh, produced outlining the main uh, benefits of the forestry program, the incentives, the grants that are out there, the premiums, obviously, that would be of interest to people. They're just things to look out for and to maybe read through them when you get a bit of time, you know. So the afforestation scheme, so the aim of the afforestation scheme, as we know, is to deliver an ambitious afforestation target to, to plant more trees at farm level, at, at landscape level, and uh, you know to provide ecosystem services for the environment and obviously climatic benefits too. You know to incentivize that we've we've developed twelve forest types, uh, most of which are relevant uh, for for farm forestry. If you want to diversify your farm income, if you want to plant a bit of forestry, there are a number of forest types that would be of interest to you, and I'll go through some of them now in, in, in a bit more detail. There's been a big, up, a big increase in the, the grant rates, the premium rates, over 40%. Uh, for afforestation, you need a license, uh, so you'll need to go to a registered forester. You can obviously go to your Chagas Forestry Advisor, get some uh, independent advice too, but you need a, a registered forester to, to, to assess the site and to complete your application for you. And then obviously all applications undergo a rigorous environmental assessment procedure internally here with ourselves in the department. So here are the 12 different forest types, just an overview of them. So you've got your, you've everything from your native forestry, your FT1, right down to your FT12, your your your, your commercial forestry, your Sitka spruce, and 20% broadly. So you've got a plethora of options there. I'll go through some of them now in more detail. That's just a, a, a brief overview. So I suppose the FT1, the native forest type, like I suppose you capture the two, FT1 and FT2 are really about for, uh, native forestry bead planting a corner of a field or an area or farm in native forestry. The FT2 is more focused on planting maybe a riparian woodland, a larger plot of riparian woodland, beside an aquatic zone, a relevant water course. Might be an option for, you know, for dairy farmers or, 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 or suckler farmers if you're adjoining a water course, you want to plant a bit of broadleaf along your water course for, for salt attenuation and, and nutrient attenuation. It's a very good option. Premiums are incredibly good. 1100 euro a year for 20 years if you're a farmer. The grant rates are equally very good, over 6,500 euro a hectare. The grants usually go to the forestry company. They usually do the work, they do the fencing, they maintain the site for you for, for whatever amount of years it's required, and they ensure that it's their responsibility to ensure the crop goes through the, the various stages of assessment with ourselves, you know. Then I'll skip over to forest type five, three and four more related to kind of public woodlands, native, uh, uh, community woodlands, they're probably not really relevant to this, so I won't, I won't go into forest types three and four. But forest type five is quite interesting. It's, 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 a, it's a forest type we created 
it's basically in a lot of farms you would have scrub encroachment you might have a bit of alder a bit of birch scrub coming in at the bottom of fields previous to the, this program these these parcels were not eligible for grant or premium rates so we quite often we would have asked people to exclude them because existing forestry is not eligible wasn't eligible for grant or premium back in the previous program so what we've done now is we've uh, we 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 acknowledge that this is this happens at farm level we know that this is incredibly good biodiversity value. We want, to, we want to incentivize people to keep these. We don't want people to clear them. We want people to keep them as part of their forestry plan, keep them, look after them. And there's actually a grant rate of two and a half thousand euro a hectare. There might be a bit of fencing that needs to be done and then you might do a wee bit of under planting. There might be a few invasives that need to be cleared from it. So there's a few pound there to do that. And then also there's a, an annual premium for that specific area of 350 euro a hectare. Again, if you're a farmer for 20 years, and again, it's 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 it's, a, it's about you know it's about wood production, it's about environmental protection, and very often what what I've seen in the past is there's always a parcel of land like this on a farm, you know, it's maybe gone, you know, it's, maybe it's wet or it's not, it's, it's it's a long distance from the farm, you know, it's there's always scrub on a farm. So here's something: if you have a if you're planning to plant a bit of forest, you can include this as an FT five a, a grant rate, you know, and, and get a premium for it. The other moving on to the the, the forest type six uh, six is mainly your your pure oak and your beech. Again, the grant rates are very they're similar to the native woodland six over six thousand seven hundred a hectare. The premiums over a thousand a hectare a year. Again, for twenty years, that's well over twenty thousand euro per hectare. If you want to plant some pure oak or some pure beech, then you've got your FT seven, which is your diverse broadleaf. If you want to plant about a bit of sycamore. Or Spanish chestnut, cherry, or or birch, and uh, you can also include a few additional broadleaves too. So it's not pure mixtures. You can also add a few like ten or twenty percent different species into these FD types. But it's just this is just to capture the main species and, and that, that we that, that, that this uh, forest type to, uh, site is assigned to. The grant rate for this is quite uh, quite a bit lower. It's still very good at over four thousand three hundred a hectare, and your premium is a shy of a thousand euro a hectare there a year. Uh, again, if you're a farmer for 20 years, so very good options there. Again, if you want to plant something other than just natives or or, or your conifers, you know. <clears throat> then your forest type eight agroforestry, getting a lot of interest. You know, this is basically where you can plant trees in wide spacing and continue uh, a level of farming uh, b between and under the trees. Basically, you know, you can you can see a picture there, a bit of silage uh, being cut there. You can see cows grazing between the trees, sheep grazing between the trees. It's gaining a lot of momentum across Europe and the UK. So it's just something to look into. Grant rates have increased uh, significantly. Uh, they're over eight and a half thousand euro a hectare. Premium rates are just shy of a thousand euro a hectare for 10 years only. Now, there are multiple benefits to agroforestry. There have been a few conferences, and I, I, I would I would I would encourage people to look into agroforestry. You know, there you can produce timber. You can keep plant. You can keep farming underneath it. You can keep cutting silage. Whatever, whatever you want to do, there there are many options for agroforestry. And you know, from an animal husbandry and welfare point of view, there there are a plethora of benefits there. You know, and the research is there to show it. You know. Then you've got your FT ten. If you want to go down the route of continuous cover forestry, you know, at the get go, get a, a diverse range of species planted. You know what it now. The, the, the FT10, there's a dominance of conifers here, but they're diverse conifers. You have your Norway spruce, your Sitka, you can go in with your Western Red Cedar, your Douglas fir, your Western Hemlock. So there's a range of different species that you can plant under the, the continuous cover forest FT, the FT10. Again, the grant rate is just over 5,400 a hectare, and the annual premium is just over 900 euro a hectare a year for 20 years. So again, if, you're, if, you, if, you, if you want to go down that route, and again, that's gaining more momentum too, is where... You know, looking at, at different you know forest management models, it is something that a lot of people are looking at, and this is a, a forest type that we've introduced for the first time that will get you in there with a diverse mix and get you get you planting and with, with that uh, management in mind. You know. Next uh, is your FT11. This is your your mixed high forest cut with conifers and twenty percent broadleaf. This would be your if you wanted to plant, for example, eighty percent of pure Scots pine or Norway spruce. Douglas fir, and then your 20% broadleaf. So the 20% broadleaf requirement is a state aid rule that we have to assign to every forest that we plant by area. So if you want to plant Sitka spruce, you have to plant 20% of that area with broadleaves. If you want to plant 
Norway spruce, you have to plant 20% of that area with, with, with broadleaf. So that's just what the European Commission uh, uh, have asked us to do. So also, the grant rate here is uh, just over 4,400 euro a hectare. Premium is eight, over 860 a hectare again, a year for 20 years if you're a farmer. The FT12 is probably in conjunction with native uh, forest. The FT1 is probably, they're probably 45, 45% each. Uh, they're, th these are probably, the FT1s probably about 50, 50 between forest type 12 and FT1, as I said. So this is your Sitka spruce. This is our bread and butter in, in, in our forestry sector. So you're 80% Sitka, and then you have to plant 20% broadleaves too, you know. And the grant rate there is just over 3,800 euro a hectare. And your annual premium is just over 740 a hectare per year for 20 years. So they're just the main forest types that we have under the normally forestation scheme if you want to plant with a license. The, the other thing that we've introduced is what we call the native three area scheme. You might have heard a lot about it. Uh, you know, and you might have spoken to some of your Chagas forest advisors or your foresters about it. We haven't had the uptake that we wished to get so far, so we're looking for more people to engage with. Uh, we are introducing, we're going to hold another training event over the next week or two for registered foresters and Chagas advisors to clarify a number of things. But I'm just going to go through the native tree area scheme here now just to, to explain the different, uh, the, the different scenarios that we have on offer. So this is basically, there are two options on the native tree area scheme. And the big thing is you don't need an afforestation license. Like we're turning these around in four to six weeks at the minute. Uh, you know, there's a there's an in now kind of a system. So we have a, we have a layer that uh, registered foresters and Chagas advisors have access to, where you can basically. What I would advise people is bring your forester or your Chagas advisor, send in your 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 BPS map mark on the on the map the area you're thinking about, or maybe ask the Chagas advisor or the forester to look at the map, and maybe on at, on your farm, maybe identify the areas that the native tree areas you might be possible might be eligible. Now, what is important to note. That's only an indicative map. It will require a site visit by a registered forester, and a registered forester has to do your application. And there may be a fee included in there. That's up, that's between yourselves uh, as the landowner and the registered forester, you know. So the suitable NTA sites, they have to be used for farming purposes, and the planted area must be retained as a valuable semi-natural farm feature. So the Forestry Act does apply. So when you plant it, it must remain in forestry, you know. So there are two separate NTAS interventions available, the NTA1, creation of small native forests, and the NTA2, the creation of native forests for water protection specifically. So the NTA1 is for climate change mitigation, biodiversity, shelter, landscape enhancement, and habitat connectivity on the farm. You can plant up to one hectare. Now that's up to, you can plant half a hectare, you can plant the corner of a field, with 0.3 of a hectare, again, it's up to yourself, but you can plant up to one hectare. And you can add an additional 0.15 of a hectare of, of, of area, so unplanted area, we call it an area of biodiversity enhancement. So you'll have a total area, if you want to max that out, of 1.15 hectares, and you'll be paid on that. The planting grant's very generous. It's a small site, you know, the economics are challenging, so the grant rate is very, very good. That's over six thousand seven hundred euro a hectare. You can also apply for the tree deer tree shelter scheme uh, if you're in an area where the the incident of deer is uh, are high. I would I would uh, actively encourage people to be aware of that. Be deer aware. You know we have a lot of issues with deer around the country, especially when we're planting broadleaves. There is a fencing allowance of between eight hundred eight hundred and ten to two thousand eight hundred a hectare, and the annual premium is two thousand two hundred and six euro per hectare. For 10 years, so you get over 22,000 euro if you plant a hectare of NTA1. So it's very, very good. So I would really encourage people to look at it, you know, as an option. It's not a big area, even if you want to plant maybe two corners or three corners of a farm and make up the hectare, it's very good, you know. NTA2, so this is all about water protection. So this is where we want to encourage farmers to plant new native forests and come up in combination with an undisturbed water setback. Key here is protecting and enhancing water quality. We hear a lot about water quality, nitrates derogation, you know, water quality in general. This is something that we can do at farm level to really, really improve water quality locally. You know, and, and, and if, if we combine our efforts, we, we, it's going to have a big impact. You know, so again, you can plant up to a hectare uh, adjoining an aquatic zone. 
uh, again, you'll have the additional 0.15 of a hectare, so it's 1.15 of a hectare max. And again, the grant rates is the same as the NTA1. The annual premium is slightly higher, 2,284 a hectare for 10 years. And again, as I said, for 10 years, it's over 22,000 euros. So again, it's, it's, it's a very good option if you have an aquatic zone or if you have water features where this might be a, an option. Talk to your forester, talk to your Chagas advisor, get the advice and, and, and see as a possibility that you want to go down, a route that you want to go down. And this is just to depict how it might look the end, in particular the NTA2. So you have your you have your 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 aquatic zone here, your rubber, you have your undisturbed setback. You can plant a few trees dotted around the setback. That's no problem at all. We would actually encourage that because you know it's good actually for the dapple effect and to protect, you know, to 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 even to to manage water temperatures for trees to be planted close to water, water edge zone. So we would encourage this type of planting scenario. You have your, your planting layout for an NTA2 intervention. Again, speak to your forester. Every site is different, you know, and walk the, walk the farm, walk the plots. You know, discuss what what are the best options silviculturally culturally and for your farm. So, so just to go through those options with them before you make your application. So then, just to go through for with them, afforestation scheme. You have your farmer, non-farmer, twenty years for farmer, fifteen years for the non-farmer. We have twelve forest types. Qualification criteria for farmer premium. There's there's information out there on that, and Chag your Chagas forest advisor will be able to give you some advice there too. You require a license and. Again, you need a registered forester to do your application. Native tree area scheme, it's outside of the afforestation scheme, it's open to farmers and non-farmers, 10 years of premium. The land, the land must be currently used for farming purposes. You can have a max of two hectares, so one hectare of NTA1, one hectare of NTA2 at farm level. Exemption for requirement uh, to obtain a license, so it's a simple process, but you do require a registered forester because they have the expertise, the silvicultural expertise, develop that plan and that application for you. That's everything for me. Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope that was very uh, that was beneficial and interesting. Yeah, that was very, very clear, Seppi. Thank you. Thank you very much. You might stop sharing there. And uh, uh, what, what, we will have that presentation available by uh, early next week. So if anybody wants to, to download it, it, it gives a really clear indication of exactly what is uh, available to uh, to all and we had a question there about farmers and non-farmers so it, it is available to, to to both categories with slightly different conditions i presume on your own website you you have information similar to, to that as well if people are looking for it tom you uh do you want to share your your presentation so you're looking more at the practical implementation at farm level for for forestry yeah, okay, I, I'll, I'll share it. And, and just in terms of uh, that information, Pat, as you ask, it will be on the department's website and also on the Tagus website if people want to access that. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll share the screen, hopefully um, you can see it. Yeah, that's perfect. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I just, yeah, as you say, I'm, I'm looking at uh, in terms of opportunities to integrate forests into farms, just a, a few slides there um, on, on that. So uh, the, the topics um, would be just getting started, what we call whole farm planning to integrate all aspects of the farm, the farmer premium that was mentioned, a few of the scheme interactions, and if there's time, uh, just a couple of the financial um, scenarios for scheme interaction. So just getting started in forestry and initially there's a need to set clear objectives. I think that's very important for anybody for, for what you want from your new farm, uh, what it can deliver for you, particularly in relation to your farm and also your family and successors. We call this whole farm planning and Togas can support you in this regard. And for new proposals, uh, as Seppi mentioned, it's important to confirm your status regarding the eligibility of the land for future grant aid. Um, and this includes putting a focus on the appropriate soil types and also the environmental considerations that was mentioned. Um, so planning a new forest in, in, involves engaging a registered forester uh, to make the, a forest application, um, the, the grant application on your behalf. And as your forest establishes, it's also important to take an active interest 
in its progress and its management that will always pay dividends. And just looking a small bit deeper into whole farm planning and forestry plays a very important role in, in enhancing the farm sustainability in terms of the financial, the environmental and the social pillars of sustainability. And there's lots of things to consider. For example, matching species um, with the site type. What's your objective and what tree species will meet your objectives? So this matching is, is a particular important cornerstone on, on your journey and maybe considering a mix of forest types you can have commercial forestry combined with protective forestry. Why not consider that? And is your objective growing a very valuable timber crop to meet future needs um, in terms of our, our housing requirements, our growing housing requirements, the opportunity to incorporate timber more, uh, more, more fully into the built environment? So questions there. Um, what are the interactions of forestry with the farming enterprise and also with the schemes? That's quite important. Certainly worth considering and exploring how forestry can provide real tax efficiencies and also efficiencies in terms of the return on labour on the farm. Um, of course, well-planned forestry, and CEPI has outlined some of the options there, well-planned forestry can provide multiple environmental benefits from water quality protection, biodiversity protection, carbon capture, and landscape benefits in terms of connectivity and habitat creation. Um, it can also play an important part in providing a resource. People maybe sometimes overlook this, a resource for family recreation and, and, and well-being. Um, it can also, I suppose, play an important role in terms of efficient planning for retirement um, and inheritance succession planning, that kind of area. And just remember as well that it is a permanent land use change and that, that has to be taken into account in terms of the interactions um, and, and the whole farm planning scenario. So we mentioned the farmer status for pre forestry premium purposes and, and what's the criteria there. So you need to be an approved participant in the basic income support for sustainability scheme. That's the BIS for short. In the year of application for forestry, so an approved participant, but also be an approved participant in either BIS or the forerunner to that, which was the basic payment scheme in each of the previous four years before your forestry application year. So, for example, if you're applying for forestry planting in 2024, you need to be an approved BIS participant in this year in 24, but also a BPS or BIS participant between 2020 and 2023. That's the previous four years for the relevant scheme involved. So just looking at the, this BIS and eligibility regarding forestry, and th this is very attractive because forestry planted since 2009 and which will be planted in 2024 uh, can be eligible for the BIS payment as well as the forestry supports but it needs to provide, I suppose, the provision for satisfying the, the conditions of, of this. So for forestry planted in 2023 and 2024, the requirement is that the land to be planted gave a right to payment under the basic payment scheme. So qualifying applicants must have claimed and been paid the basic payment scheme at some point between the years 2015 and 2022 to be deemed eligible um, and then for forestry planted before 2023, so between January 2009 and December 2022, the land must have been deemed eligible land in 20, sorry, in 2008 and must have received the single payment scheme payment in, in 2008 prior to being planted um, from January 2009 onwards. So there's a, that's a bit more intricate there, but it's important to look at the eligibility for this uh, in part of the planning application. And again, the forested lands must meet all the requirements of the relevant scheme under which it was established. One other key BIS eligibility to mention, to benefit from the BIS payment on planted land, uh, the BIS applicant or applicants must be the person or persons named as the forestry scheme beneficiary or joint beneficiary. This is really important. So it means that if you are the BIS applicant this year, you must also be the person or persons eligible for payment of the forestry premium. 
In other words, that there should be a name common to both the BIS application and the forestry contract. So that's important to bear in mind. It applies to members of the same family and it should be fully considered, for example, in areas where the farm is being transferred, including within families. So there are important points to consider there. And then an another scheme, Chris, which is the complementary redistributive support for sustainability scheme, and I suppose known as front loading as well. And it's basically an annual decoupled payment per eligible hectare to farmers that are entitled to the basic income support. And for el eligible applicants under CRIS, there's payment on the first 30 eligible hectares claimed. And this can include eligible forestry and also eligible agroforestry. So th th that's uh, another positive there in terms of scheme interaction. If we're looking at the acres, and quite a number of people would have gone into the acres uh, agri environmental scheme, and the terms and conditions allow for parcel interaction with afforestation and also the native tree area scheme without financial penalty. So parcels within, in acres won't get the forestry payment, but um, they can be split to facilitate planting if that suits the situation. In addition, the department may authorize under certain conditions an action that has been taken as part of an acres contract that could be terminated or the area adjusted before the normal in date. And this can be done without penalty or without full reimbursement of funding. Um, if the beneficiary subscribes to a new commitment that's considered of equal or higher benefit to the environment and, and or to the climate. And importantly, that the existing commitment is completed for a minimum of two years. And the proposed new commitment is part of the Ireland's EU approved national forestry program. So that's uh, uh, an interaction between acres and forestry. Um, looking at the organic farming scheme and forestry, and on, under the organic farming scheme, again, forestry is recognized as contributing and very valuable to the creation of landscape mosaic at farm level. Uh, good planning required there. The organic farming scheme parcels may be converted to forestry during the, the organic contract period without penalty. Now, Sepi Sep, mentioned the 12 forest types, um, and the vast majority of those uh, won't get be eligible for the organic farming scheme payment, with one exception. Land declared as agroforestry can be eligible for the agroforestry grants and premiums, the BIS, CRIS, possibly the ECO scheme, and also can be eligible for the organic payments at the dry stock rate. So th that is a, quite a positive benefit for um, agroforestry, basically linking in with the organic farming scheme. Um, looking at the areas of natural constraint, um, and this, um, this, I suppose we'd have called this in the past to disadvantage the area payment or the compensatory allowance. And there would have been, there's three categories there. Category one, formerly uh, the mountain category, um, paid up to 34 hectares. Category two, would have been called more severely disadvantaged, paid up to 30 hectares. You can see the rates there. And category three, the, the um, less severely disadvantaged on, under the old scheme. And just, I suppose, the interaction here is that ANC payments and forestry supports are not payable on the same land. Um, but there are opportunities and there may be opportunities for farmers, we'll say with larger farms, to optimize these ANC payments and also plant some land, perhaps if they're above the 30 or 34 hectare maximum payment threshold. So that's just an overview of some of the schemes. Important to say that, um, it, you know, check in detail, in more detail, your qualification for all schemes and in good time. And this presentation here is giving an overview of important qualifying requirements, but it's not exhaustive. Um, and so it's essential to check all details on your farm situation to ensure that the criteria are being fully met. So we're giving an overview here, but do, in other words, just look into it in a bit more detail before you uh, proceed with, with the planning. I'm just going to finish off um, with a couple of notional case studies. For example, here, a first case study, if a farmer, a dry stock farmer has about 35 hectares, assuming the assumption here is eligibility for BIS, CRIS, the ECO scheme, 
A, A and C in organics and looking at planting or planting uh, 10 hectares of forest type 12. That's the commercial type forestry, mainly conifers, um, Sitka spruce, with uh, a proportion of 20% broad leaves and another area of 15% for biodiversity enhancement. That's forest type 12. So if we're looking at the, the different um, schemes and how they interact, um, if meeting the criteria, the forestry can also be eligible for BIS. So BIS could be paid under full 35 hectares. Chris is paid up to 30 hectares, so it could incorporate half of the forestry, uh, five hectares. The maximum for Chris is 30 hectares. I'm assuming here that the eco scheme, which I haven't really gone into, um, can be payable on all the eligible land, including forestry. But that means that the applicant must meet the eco scheme criteria. For example, maybe having enough space for nature across the overall holding. Um, A and C won't be paid under forestry. So you take off 10 hectares, it's paid on 25 hectares if, if it meets the eligibility. And for this forest type 12, um, it won't be eligible for organic payments or the organics would be paid under 25 hectares. And the overall premium for 10 hectares annually of forestry, forest type 12 would be 746 euro per hectare per year. So the overall figure here is quite a, a substantial payment. And just a second case study to finish, if we're looking at the agroforestry option, and again, we're looking at a dry stock farmer with 35 hectares eligible for the BIS, CRIS, ANC and organics. So the, the, the main difference here would be that the organic, um, far, the organic farmer who's planting agroforestry, um, if meeting the conditions, can also get paid at a dry stock rate on the agroforestry. So instead of 25 hectares down here, there's a, a 35 hectare full payment. And also the agroforestry um, on 10 hectares has a higher premium rate for 10 years rather than 20. So again, a substantial payment here. This is just giving you an idea of the overall scheme interactions. And I'll just finish off by flagging an event that's coming up, if you don't mind. Uh, it's coming up on the 14th of March. It's our annual uh, Talking Timber, which is a timber marketing event. Very popular, very well attended each year. Um, in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture, Food and Forest Industry Ireland. It's on in the Ballycastin Hotel in Limerick Junction. Um, again, as I say, on the, on the 14th, starting at 9.30. And this event has a, a number of elements, an outdoor demonstration, which can uh, allow attendees to view the quality of timber that's required by the Irish uh, sawmilling sector and maybe some of the products that are there and a good overview of them um, in terms of, of marketing timber and uh, the opportunities there. Indoor presentations from forestry experts from the Department of Agriculture. We have guests speaking on taxation from IFAC. We have a forest owner giving um, his um, considerable experience and looking at the whole timber measurement and forest measurement, the importance of that. And also a very good opportunities for networking right through the day which runs between 9.30 and about 2.30. So that's the 14th of March at uh, Limerick Junction. So I'll, I'll finish with that, Pat, if that's okay, and uh, stop, stop sharing. That's great. Um, I think a, a, a deluge of, of, of questions, if Seppi and, and Liam want to, jo uh, to join us. Liam Kelly is, has joined us this morning to, to uh, mm -hmm. ask questions. I think uh, one of our, our uh, colleagues from Quilch have reminded us that National Tree Week takes place from sun this Sunday till the, the following Sunday. So this fits in uh, quite nicely with, with that. Uh, Tom, you, you mentioned in passing the tax uh, benefits. Yes. Uh, and I suppose for a lot of farmers who have uh, an income off farm or a family farm or a, 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 an income from the family, the fact that the, some of those premiums are uh, uh, non-taxable is a huge benefit and adds hugely to the overall uh, uh, benefit that, that you described in terms of the, 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 the 26,000 in the example could in reality mean much more because of that. Yes, I, I think it's something that's, that's uh, as you correctly point out, Pat, is, is often overlooked. And 
Um, like the tax situation it, 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 it is quite, you know, it, it, it's something that needs to be looked at very closely and, and in detail. Um, if people are getting into forestry and also, for example, if they're marketing timber or if there's transfers of forestry or sale of forestry, there can be quite strong benefits. For example, if you look at just taxation from an income point of view, the farm, a farm, a farm that's occupied by woodland to manage on a commercial basis with a view to realising profit, it's income tax free. No, it is um, liable for the USC uh, and also for P PRSI, but it is income tax free, which is a huge benefit. Um, if you look at the, some of the, the capital grants, for example, the capital gains tax from the sale of a forest, you can say the commercial woodlands that are occupied by individuals, they're exempt from capital gains on the growing timber. And usually most of the value would be on the growing timber. Um, the underlying land is not exempt. Um, and then that's kind of a similar scenario for stamp duty. The growing timber is exempt from stamp duty. And there's also areas such as capital acquisition tax. Um, there is agriculture relief there or business relief, which sometimes people maybe overlook. But it's a huge area and it's a huge benefit for people that are actually looking at forestry or, as I say, transferring on. And we will have a presentation on the 14th of March um, from IFAC, one of, one of our guest speakers on the day, that will delve more deeply into the tax situation. And we, we, within TAGAS, we'll give guidance and guidelines, but for specific scenarios, it's important to get expert advice, I would say, as well. That's really, really critical. Uh, Liam, we have a, a, a pile of questions. I remind people to use the, the Q&A, but it's, you're, you're going to be very busy for the next uh, yeah, 20 minutes. I'm, I'm going to have to speak quickly. <clears throat> um, so just, just to kick off, uh, just a question to Borty. Um, what is the current uh, interest in forestry and, and the different schemes? So maybe Tom or Seppi. Yep. I, I, I'll kick off. Maybe Seppi can come in as well. Um, since, since since the launch of the programme before Christmas, um, we've certainly experienced a very high level of interest. Um, and for example, we had, um, in conjunction with the department before Christmas, we had 20 town hall meetings right around the country, and there was over a thousand people attended. And more recently, um, we've had a nationwide series of 36 forestry clinics. They were scheduled between January the 22nd and the middle of February. Um, for people considering forestry, and they were held in local offices, providing attendees with independent and objective advice, enabling to make decisions. And due to the actual high level of demand, we had initially 36 scheduled and a further 34 clinics, day clinics were required, making up 70 overall clinic days, again, around the country. And we had about 500 participants attending these clinics and as a follow-on to this we certainly will be there, there's actually post clinic work by my forestry advisory colleagues to further assist the inquiries but we will also be looking in general terms at the trends in terms of the interest across the schemes the different schemes and also across the different forest types and what's the potential for progression to planting and maybe what are the impact impacting factors uh, okay, so if if there's some forests that are deemed um, ineligible or n not meeting the requirements, what are those factors? We'll be getting some insights into those. Hopefully, that will be valuable. Okay. Yeah, I might come in too, Liam. Like so, so I suppose figures wise, since the start of the year, we've had about we've had, we've had just had over forty afforestation applications, both in over three hundred and ten hectares. Listen, it's not a place where we want to be. We do want to see more applications come in on afforestation. We've had 305 applications in total for the NTA, with a total of 225 hectares. Again, we do want to see an, up, uh, an upswing there. It's not, again, where we want to be. We do want to inc increase the uptake of the various schemes that we have, obviously for the benefits that I've outlined and Tom's outlined, you know. But it, what I didn't mention in my presentation, there are significant changes to this program and, and they're as a result of our, our state aid approval. So just like all the other agri schemes, we have to go to Brussels with, uh, and, and seek approval for a package. We did go and we received approval for a package. 
but there are a number of restrictions that we previously hadn't been used to, I'll say. So there's a, there's a big change on, on, for example, on peat soils over 30 centimetres. So we're not allowed to plant any conifers on peat soils over 30 centimetres. We can only plant native forests on modified fens and modified cutover bogs if they're an agricultural use of the meat a certain, you could say, a fertility value. We call it came up to farming and it's, it's not a protected habitat per se. We also have uh, measures relating to breeding waders, uh, high nature value farmland and hen harrier. Now that's not to say that if you fall within this area that you shouldn't proceed and do the various reports and get an application on it. It's like a planning application. You're not guaranteed to get a planning application for a house or a slatted shed or whatever. Forest is no different now. So we're, it's a license you have to get for reforestation. And these layers just need to be assessed. They're, 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 it's a state aid requirement. We can't fudge them and we have to go through those steps to see can we get the application through them. But it's a process and I would actively encourage people just because you're in a HNB area or your forest or your Chagas advisor says, listen, you're in an HNB there, or you're in a, a, a breeding wader there, that does not preclude you from planting trees. You just have to go through a number of steps to see is it eligible, and we then assess it, and hopefully we can give an approval for it. But it's just a number of steps that have to go through. So, yeah, maybe we're not where we want to be from a, from a numbers point of view, but listen, we are. We have set up an afforestation technical working group ourselves and members of the sector have sat down to, to work through these technical challenges. The group isn't about changing the rules, it's about looking at these different environmental layers that we have to look at. And how can we guide people through that to make sure that number one, they adhere to the, the requirements of the state aid rule too, but also that they're not put off by these layers and that they're actively encouraged to go through the process to see if we get the sites planted. You know? so yeah, I don't know if that, hey. uh, that answers the name. Okay, we'll move it on. Um... Uh, would agrarian farms be considered for agroforestry? Sophie, I'll ask you that. Sorry? Would um, equine farms with horses be uh, suitable for the agroforestry scheme? I'm not too sure now. I, I, I need to look into that. I'm not too sure if it's... Yeah, if it's, uh, if it's Liam, uh, I, I would just suggest there um, that um, having equines uh, in agroforestry, I, I suppose the, the I suppose the critical area there would be to protect the trees, mm -hmm. and maybe some some of the measures that are in place, we'll say for sheep or young cattle, particularly in the early years, I think um, might be challenging for equine. Um, like there, there are opportunities to plant groups of trees rather than lines of trees in agroforestry, but the important thing would be to pre protect those trees from from equines, which which can, I suppose, present its own challenges. So I'd say it'd be something maybe to engage with, with uh, the, the department on. Um, we we are looking, just to come in there, Tom, we are looking at different planting prescriptions, for example. And we've had a few inquiries from dairy farmers, for example, and obviously the end, at the minute, what we grant aid as a protective deer tube, and their maximum height is, I think, 1.8 metres, and they're protected by two, two uh, fence posts. So like for equine, that probably wouldn't be ideal because 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 the horses or whatever they, they'll just eat the trees because they're taller than the one point eight. You know, so they'll reach the trees and they'll damage the trees. Similar for 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 a, a dairy herd, for example, that the single tree will not be protected. So we're looking at different planting prescriptions, but we are able to do that under the state aid rules. So we are looking at various planting options, as Tom alluded to, and hopefully we'll have some clarifications over the next few weeks. What else? What other agroforestry? planting measures are available for farmers, including maybe equine, you know. Okay. Just um does um Tom does agroforestry affect your nitrates um payment area? No, I suppose the, the, the good news there that has been clarified is that agroforestry can be positive and and um it can <clears throat> if you have a, a parcel of agroforestry, the fact that it's um you can also continue farming that it can be taken into account and given credit for the nitrates calculations. So we've had a number of queries on that, and that, that's the, that's a positive um, result from it, I think. Okay, just uh, two questions there, um, again, for you, Tom, for this one. Uh, um, could you clarify for what for farming purposes means? And also, is equine considered farming in relation to premium? Yeah, so... Um, for for farming farming purposes, um, and again, if you look into the the BIS scheme at the moment, um, to claim BIS, um, you need to be considered an active farmer, um, so that 
that means an applicant claiming payments on land must be farming or managing the land. So activities could include, we'll say, a meeting a minimum stocking rate of 0 0.1 livestock unit per forage hectare, producing crops, cutting hair, silage, maintaining landscape features, as long as you have got the evidence base for that in terms of maybe the receipts from contractors. So that's kind of included in, in the terms of conditions in BIS. Um, if, if you have 100% uh, eligible forestry, you can also um, indicate that on the BIS application and that will qualify you for you as an active farmer. Okay. And, and sorry, what uh, was the second question, Liam? Um, uh, is equine considered, uh, sorry, uh, is equine considered for farming purposes? Um, equine can, no, there's rules within the ANC in terms of breeding and stuff like that. So people could need to check that out a, a bit further in terms of, of livestock um, eligibility. Okay, I'm going to group these two questions again. Is uh, the scheme open to non-farmers? And also, is the scheme open to land that's owned um, by uh, local authorities? So, yeah, um, a step, a step you pointed out um, for the afforestation scheme, there's a farmer rate for 20 years. And then and I, I gave the just the general eligibility requirements. If you if you're not meeting those, you can get the, the non-farmer rate for 20 years. I think the, the exception in, in within the afforestation is agroforestry. It's payable for, for 10 years uh, to both. Um so that would be the the situation under the afforestation scheme and under the, the native tree area scheme it's open to farmers and non-farmers but the land has to be deemed to have been farmed it's farming land so it to be of a reasonably good quality i think Seppi, would that be correct yeah yeah that's correct Tom, yeah. okay um in relation to the emerging woodland um why is the rate not the same as uh, the establishing grant rates and what's to stop someone grubbing out if they had existence group and, and grubbing it out and then applying for the establishment schemes. What, what can you take that, Sebi? Well, the short answer is there's nothing stopping anyone doing it, but I suppose if you have scrub or existing woodland, you know, you need a federal license uh, to, to remove that woodland. So I would actively discourage people to remove scrub or, or, or emerging woodland from their farm because it's, it's illegal. You need a license to do it. Uh, so I don't know why the grant rate is any less. Well, the grant rate probably because it's an existing woodland. You know, the only thing that you might need is a bit of fencing, some underplanning. So the level you're not dealing with a what a new what what, what a, an unplanted field. So obviously the grant rate's a bit lower. The premium rate, I think, is the question made allude to. I don't know why it's lower. You know, it, it, it may, it's, it's maybe something that we need to look at a part of the midterm review, maybe to up it a wee bit to encourage people to put these areas in. But uh, I, I don't know why they're any less, you know, why it's any less. Yeah. Um, again, another question in relation to the ecological assessment. What uh, assessment? Why can an owner carry out that assessment themselves or what qualification would you need? The, the, the How we've termed it is you have to be suitably qualified. So, like, like obviously, not everyone can carry out a, a habitat a assessment for waders, you know, so or the HNB survey. So, the way, the way I would advise people to do is get someone who's qualified and competent to do it because if we get a good report and that we can stand over, it will ensure the application goes through the system faster. If we, if we get a substandard report, then it'll just cause delays. It'll cause maybe a further information request. It might require one of our own ecologists to go out to check it. So I would actively encourage people pay a professional to do it and do it right, and then hopefully your, your application should should get go through the system a lot faster. Uh, Tom, there's a question there uh, uh, looking at the forestry for water, and you, uh, the, you mentioned the buffer that's that's there, uh, and then the, the low area planting. But the, the question is, would it not be better in some situations uh, to have uh, more tree line banks where you might be providing stabilization of, of river banks and, and potentially some shade for, for water and keeping temperature down in, in the water. Are there situations where that might be uh, beneficial? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think SEPI can come in maybe, but um, it, within the, the actual uh, forest for water scheme, where, where there, there is a capacity for limited planting within the actual buffer area. That could be individual trees, 
or it could be small groups of trees. Um, I think no, no more than 20% in total. So, and that planting will provide allowance for uh, the multiple benefits that trees near waters can provide. Dappled shade, I think Seppi mentioned that. Um, there's leaves and material for, for, that fall into the water at times, uh, detritus, which can provide um, beneficial um, resources for aquatic life. There's shade, uh, um, th things like that, So and bank st stabilization. So there is an allowance within the buffer patch um, to plant a limited amount. Which I think is reasonable as well. There, there's a there's a quest or a couple of questions relating to the, the, the fact that that some non-native trees are allowed in, in in various schemes, and there's just a, a general question as to what is the the situation or, uh, uh, around native provenance of trees, uh, and would it be better to try and ensure that we have native provenance? And and uh, I think the inference of the first question is that we have more native species there. Yeah, I think, listen, obviously we want to uh, to encourage that people use pro native provenance as first path, but we have to realise that we have an ambitious afforestation uh, programme. We have acres, you know, there's tree planting measures there, hedge laying measures there. We have a huge requirement for trees and shrubs in this country for our various agri and forestry schemes. And at the end of the day, we're a small country. We have uh, a, a, a small number of nurseries feeding that supply and also you know we need the seed supply to grow the trees and there's a three or four year turnaround for, for nurseries that are working hard to get these plant supply to the, to the sector so we have to be realistic on our ambitions on native species obviously it's always the department's preference to use native species first and foremost but then we have to look at alternatives to ensure we can get our schemes implemented and we obviously have our, our various plant health measures there to protect us from those issues you know and we just have to rely on those to keep the thing moving you know if, if I can come in as well, Pat, um, just in terms of, I suppose, does the debate that, that goes on in terms of native or, or, or non-native trees, and I, I think that there's room for both, and I think there's a need for both. So there, there's strong ambitions within the new programme and within the new forest strategy to um, enhance the amount of native planting. But we also need to look at our, our you know, our, our national requirements in terms of a wood resource, um, on, under the Housing for All plan, I think we're, we're looking at, at uh, putting in a huge amount of additional homes um, and the timber resource there definitely will come from the commercial planting. And like I said in my presentation, there's, I don't see any reason why both can fit in together. For example, you could have a, a commercial-based forest that will give you a very attractive returns, but also you can incorporate a bit of agroforestry or if you're near a water course, you can put in the forest for water planting, which will provide uh, definite, definite protection and, and multiple benefits near, near water um, resources. So I think there's room for both. And I think we certainly need, need both in the future. Um, if we're looking at um, incorporating more timber into our built environment, and I think that's growing in momentum. Timber frame houses are down at the mid 20s, I think, percentage. In other countries, they're right up in, into the 70s and 80s. There, there's, there are certain countries and they're building villages of, of timber constructed um, uh, buildings. So I think we can be ambitious there, but we need, we need the uh, resources there as well. And we need to be more self-sufficient in our timber supply as well in the future. I'd say there's room for both. And that would be my view on it. Okay. Liam, still plenty of questions coming in? Yeah, still coming in. Um, just getting back to the NTA. Um, Seppi, what is the minimum weight again for the NTA scheme? And also, just there seems to be difficulty with the NTA too, people trying to get the, the area up to one hectare because it's normally 400 metres by 25 metres wide or so. So people are finding it difficult to get up to that area. So will that be reviewed or... You know, so well, you see, for the NTA two, we can't review it, Liam, because it's enshrined in the in, in the regulation, the legislation. The NTA two it must be twenty meters wide, tree to tree, width. So from the tree to tree, that's the width. So again, it all goes back to the definition of a forest, like you know. So again, we can't change the width. I did outline earlier. We are working on bringing a few changes for the NTA one, where we can reduce. You know, if, if you want to, for example, plant a corner of a field, we've had a lot, a lot of inquiries about that. And you're caught with this minimum width of 20 meters. You know, we have said in the AFORS, in the Forestry Standards Manual, you can reduce your width 
uh, from 20 to 10 meters for 10 percent of your plot we've actually increased that without this 10 meter rule up to 30 percent for the nta that's what we're going to do just to allow people under the nta one to do that we're also hoping to bring in a, 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 a one or two changes to bring in more water features and under the nta too but we're hoping to clear to, to actually a circular and that to the sector in the next week or two that'll clarify that too and maybe bring in other water features and under the nta too Okay, and Tom, just a question in relation to transfer during the lifetime of a, of a program of twenty year premium for the farmer okay. the qualifies, but then he transfers it, uh, you know, midway through to a son or daughter. Will they qualify? So you might just clarify where the where he, they may qualify. Yeah, so in, in that scenario, Liam, where the, we'll say where the land is inherited, um, by an immediate family member, the scheme provides that the new owner will receive the farmer rate that's maybe on their passing, but also. There is a facility for people where the inherited or where the forest is inherited or planned as gifted that can also um, come under that rule. And so the person, the, re the recipient will qualify at the farm rate also. OK, and uh, just just to clarify, uh, does these schemes um, fit in for uh, local authority land again? Uh, Sepi, just people are just asking to clarify that again. Yeah, public authorities can apply. Like we're dealing with various public authorities, Irish Water, National Parks and Wildlife Service, and local authorities can engage. And like there are schemes, for example, the neighbourhood scheme. You know, we've got a few very good ones around the country where you know landowners can come together with native, with, with for example, local authorities and other agencies. So yeah, to answer the question, yes, they can. And again, another one just on the forest, uh, food forest planting. This is the, the new element under the agroforestry. Can you can you say when that's uh, yeah, has there been much interest or take up on that yet? No, I think we need to finalize how that's going to look. But no, I, I don't know when that's going to be launched. It'll be in the next couple of months, I would say, Liam. And I, I understand it'll be on a, a pilot basis uh, initially you know, for a number of hectares. And uh, it, like, I, I, I'm sure there'll be learnings as, as, as they go along in terms of, you know, what, what, what what's the best um, format and structure for it. So I, there's always learnings uh, as we move forward, I think. And just, Tom, again, just can you clarify the difference between the farmer rate and the non-farmer again? So just the, in relation to the number of years and... Yeah, so the the the, the farmer rate is paid um, for, for, for the majority of the forest types. Um, the farm rate is paid for 20 years. Um, and the qualifying there is, as I mentioned, that you need to be a BIS applicant in the year of app application, but also look back to the previous four years, either being in BIS or being in the previous basic payment scheme. That's the application eligibility requirement. Uh, for non-farmer paid at, at uh, 15 years, for 15 years rather than 20 years. The agroforestry measure is paid um, over 10 years for both farmers and, and non-farmers. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, go on. And the na native tree area scheme, um, which provides very attractive annual premiums of over um, 2,000 euro per hectare, are, is paid over a 10-year period. It, it's open to farmers and non-farmers um, but the land needs to have been deemed to be farmed. Okay. And just, Tom, again, can you just clarify the interaction between the acres and the new forestry schemes? Okay, so you, you won't get a payment, acres payment and forestry payment on the same land. But say, if you are in acres, you could look at the option, for example, of if there was a parcel, say, with a hedgerow in it, you can actually, or an area-based uh, measure you you can actually look if it's appropriate to split a parcel and maybe consider forestry in in part of that but you need to look at what are the requirements for each individual measure um i think there's there's been a lot of questions about the interaction of various payments but i think it's fair to say that a huge amount of work has gone into making the the various payments and schemes really complementary this time where you have this and chris available where you're obviously the ANC is not and an acres payment uh, uh, not and there's a question there in relation to uh, organic but you can operate the two side by side in 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 those cases so I think 
uh, it's been made, I think, very attractive for, uh, for people to have a combination of those. Yeah, uh, we're, we're this, getting a lot of queries, Pat, in terms of, I think there's growing interest, uh, and Seppi mentioned there, in terms of the organic farming scheme and how it can positively in interact with agroforestry and agroforestry seems to be growing uh, there's a growing level of interest in it so you can um, a, a eligible applicant for agroforestry can also look at um, drawing down the organic farming um, payment at the dry stock rate if, if all the eligibility criteria are met okay listen we're going to have to to call a halt there we've can't believe that hour has just uh, uh, passed by so so quickly. Uh, thanks to to both you, Tom, and, and, and Seppi for a really clear presentation. I think there's a huge number of comments have come in, just appreci in appreciation of a, a, a really clear presentation. I think we have a lot of work to do for all of us. I, hopefully you guys will be really busy over the next year with, with, with potential applications uh, uh, coming in. That's, that's, that's a, a, a success. Uh, so thanks very much for, for joining us. Thanks to, to, to Liam. Uh, thank you for Mary for, for uh, helping us with, with the, the presentation or with the, the uh, webinar, setting up the webinar. Next week, we'll be joined by Owen uh, Cashman, who is a, a PhD student uh, working in Salahed Farm. And he's looking at the work there in terms of lowering greenhouse gas and ammonia uh, footprint of a pasture-based dairy production system. So really innovative work going on down in, in Salahed uh, in terms of looking at, I suppose, the, the re really high levels of, of reduction of, of emissions of both uh, greenhouse gases and, and ammonia. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, thank you again for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week.